Hello, Isaac here. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So, I'm currently doing a series of videos to provide an overview of Larry Hurtado's book, Destroy of the Gods, whilst also adding my own commentary, thoughts and considerations along the way. So, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe if you're enjoying this series. It really helps, helps us out here. And if you think anyone else would enjoy this content, please do share it with them. So, in this video, we're looking at two distinctives of Christianity within the Greco-Roman world, which have subsequently shaped our assumptions about religion itself in the West, the first of which is the exclusive character of Christianity, since it insisted that only the one God of the biblical tradition should be worshipped. And secondly, its inclusive character, since it was trans-ethnic and provided a religious identity that was separate from a person's ethnic or national identity. To truly understand how strange and radical Christianity was, one must understand the religious character of the early Roman Empire, which was, as Larry Hurtado notes, a world full of gods. So this is what we shall turn to now. The religious character of the early Roman Empire was, as Larry Tyler notes, a world full of gods. To begin with, there, there was the traditional Roman pantheon, presided over by Jupiter, often identified with Zeus, the chief deity of the Greek pantheon. But besides this, the Romans adopted or allowed other deities that originated in various parts of the empire. As Larry Hurtado writes, the most well-known deities were associated with particular peoples, particular ge geographical areas, particular ways of life, particular forces of nature, and particular cities. Each of the many peoples of the Roman Empire <coughs> had their own traditional and multiple deities. And in that period, the tendency was to recognize and welcome them all. Now, there was a tendency often to link deities from different places, seeing them as an alter ego of the same deity. For example, Jupiter is identified with Zeus, king of the gods, Artemis with Diana, goddess of the hunt, Poseidon with Neptune, god of the sea, Dionysus with Bacchus, god of wine. But in other cases, deities that originated in one place were adopted by people in another and reverenced under the same name, the most successful of these being Mithras and Isis. Nonetheless, there were, in addition to the high deities, lesser and other divine beings that figured regularly in religious practice. In Rome, there were beings called Lares that functioned as guardians over various settings, most common of which are the domestic Lares of each household. These spirits protected the family and all the members of the family were at least expected to reverence them daily in offerings and prayers at the Lararium, a small altar typically placed in a Roman household. Besides domestic Lares, there was Lares of bridges, crossroads and other sites, and even Lares Augusti, guardians of the Roman state. What is clear then is that these Lares featured regularly in the day-to-day -day ritual life of the people. Therefore, reverence for the deities had a ubiquitous place in the lives of people at the time and was an integral feature of the life. Residents of a city were expected to take part in periodic expressions of reverence such as processions and sacrificial offerings to the guardian god or goddess of the city. And even in ordinary activities such as giving birth or eating or traveling, in the meeting of the guilds or in other social groups, in, or in the form of meeting of a city council, for example, people typically offered appropriate expressions of reverence to the relevant deities. The massive place of religious activity in every city is often reflected in the city layouts as there are many temples and shrines right at the center of each city. Besides this, it was a central part of the economy with people raising animals for the sacrificial rites in the temples craft workers making small images of deities for personal use or as souvenirs and as ex voto objects being purchased and left in a temple to give thanks to a deity. 
as Larry Hurtado writes, from the lowest to the highest spheres of society, all aspects of life were assumed to have connection with divinities of various kinds. There was really nothing like the modern notion of a separate secular space of life, free from de deities and relevant rituals. This in essence goes at the heart of what religion meant in the ancient world. The Greek term Eusebia designated reverence or respect which could be shown towards the gods. Likewise, the Latin term religio designated sacred rites and sacrificial practices, but it could also be used to connote scrupulous, being scrupulous about various duties or responsibilities. But in any case, for Roman area people generally, what we call religious practice, that is sacred or traditional rites, is more characteristic than religious beliefs. But what is important to underscore is that all deities were worthy of reverence. Therefore, religion meant a readiness to show appropriate reverence of the gods, any and all of them, when the occasion called for it. For example, on a visit to some other city or land, you might be invited to take part in the rites associated with the deities of that place. And you would typically accept that invitation without any hesitation. Outright refusal was not only bizarre, but it was impious and irreligious. Therefore, Christians would have stood out as quite different, as they simply refused to take part in the worship of any god other than the one god of the biblical tradition. Given that Christians did not take part in the worship of any deity other than the one God of the biblical tradition, their exclusivity would have stood out as quite different. Moreover, given the ubiquitous place of the gods, it would have been quite difficult for Christians to simply avoid all such rituals without being noticed, and it certainly would have caused problems when it came to family and close acquaintances. Besides this, the refusal to worship the traditional deities of cities and peoples, or the deities that represented the empire itself, such as the goddess Roma, who conferred legitimacy to Roman rule, would have been seen as a grave impiety that not only disregarded the political social order, but which brought the wrath of the gods on the people. Despite this, Christians were expected to treat all of these many deities as idols, from the Greek term eidolon, meaning image or phantom. That is, they were not only unworthy of worship, but they were also false and deceptive entities, demonic beings masquerading as deities. As Larry Hurtado writes, in short, precisely that which was generally considered piety, religio, eusebia, reverencing the many gods was for early Christians in piety of the gravest sort. There is therefore a distinctive vocabulary expressing a disdain of pagan deities, from the idol temple to the idol meat to idolatry to idolater. In 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, Paul engages at length on how pagan converts were to conduct themselves in relation to pagan deities and declares that pagan sacrifices are offered to demons and not to God. And he urges, I do not want you to be partners with demons. Of course, this stance against idolatry developed from ancient Jewish circles, but although it was deemed to be bizarre and objectionable, it was regarded as an example of a national peculiarity of a distinctive people an ethnos or nation. The wider Roman era public were aware of an accommodated ethnic diversity that made up the empire, but those addressed by Paul were dominantly what Jews called Gentiles, that is, non-Jews. These people could not claim any traditional ethnic privilege to justify their refusal to worship the gods. In other words, a pagan might choose to convert fully to Judaism, becoming a proselyte and effectively changing their ethnic status, which could justify their refusal 
to participate in worshipping pagan gods as, ex as expressive of their new ethnic membership, but former pagans who joined the early Christian church did not become Jews, which is what Paul, Peter and James are at pains to emphasize at the first council of the church in Acts 15. As Larry Hurtado writes, Unlike Jewish proselytes, Paul's pagan converts did not change their ethnic identity. They did not cease being what they were in terms of family, civic and ethnic identity and responsibilities, except regard, with regard to their religious responsibilities. But again, this meant in the eyes of fellow Gentiles, pagans, these converts to the Jewish movement had no right to excuse themselves from reverence in the gods. For Paul then, whether you were a Jew or a Greek, slave or free, male or female, this is now secondary to your new status in Christ as a member of a new social and religious identity, the Ecclesia, the church. Irrespective of their ethnic, social or biological categories, therefore all believers were now to take on a new and supervising identity in Christ. And so, were to treat one another as fellow members in a body newly defined by faith in Christ. In this way, the early Christian movement was radically inclusive and trans-ethnic, which we'll explore in due course. But before then, I'll briefly touch on how early Christian movement differed in terms of its practices and beliefs from traditional religion in the Roman world. As we've seen so far, Christianity seemed to have redefined what was meant by religion in the ancient world. As Larry Tower writes, in a number of ways, early Christianity lacked things that typically and for the most ancient contemporaries essentially comprised religion. No altar, no cult image, no priesthood, no sacrifices and no shrines. But this is not to say that Christianity didn't have rituals that expressed its beliefs, most prominent of these being the initiation rite of baptism. Typically, ritual washing in the ancient world cleansed the person in preparation for entrance to a temple or participation in a sacrifice or the cultic activities. But early Christian baptism functioned as the rite by which one actually became a member of the Ecclesia, a one-time rite that marks the separation of the initiate from their pre-Christian past. Besides this, they had shared meals, the Eucharist, which had deep religious significance. In the ancient world, group meals often followed an animal sacrifice to a god, with part of the animal being burnt and given to the god, whilst the remainder being given to the temple or priests, and as a shared meal by those who made the offering. But the Lord's Supper is much more than an occasion for a shared meal, as it is linked to the very redemptive death of Jesus and one in which Jesus is spiritually present and presiding in power. Lastly, there is a distinctive pattern of prayer, with the recitation of the Lord's Prayer and practice of assembling weekly, which was quite unusual. The pagan practice was for individuals to approach this or that deity for favours when they were needed and group worship was associated more with special days of the year or month connected with a particular deity. But Christians met weekly in analogous manner to the Jewish synagogue practice in order to read from the scriptures and partake of the Lord's Supper. In terms of distinctive beliefs, there was a lack of images of deity as God was radically transcendent, which ref reflects a developed Jewish view. In the philosophical tradition, an ultimate and radically transcendent God was often postulated, but the early Christian stance was that the one true and radically transcendent God was also available to have a direct relationship with people and that he loves the world and humanity. 
This is reflected in the language used, as ancient pagan thinkers often spoke of human love for a god or gods, typically as eros, not as an erotic love, but as desire to be associated with the divine. In terms of, the, in terms of a god's love towards humans, they often use the term philia, depicting a kind and friendly quality. Christians, on the other hand, preferred the term agape and its cognate verb agapa, which appears copiously in early Christian texts. This represents a more sober love, emphasizing a moral commitment to a loved one, as Larry Hurtado writes. The notion that gods love humanity, anything approaching relational intensity ascribed the god rather ubiquitously in early Christian texts is, to put it mildly, hard to find in pagan texts of the Greek or Roman period. Indeed, the emphasis on God's love and the appeal for an answering love ethic characterizing Christian conduct compromise something distinctive. We simply do not know of any other Roman era religious group in which love played this important role in discourse or behavioral teaching. Therefore, it's not just about the exclusive for worship in Christianity, but it's about what the term God meant for Christians as the notion of a transcendent God that also sought to, to relate to the world and humanity in redemptive love was quite simply bizarre. Moreover, the ancient Jewish confession of the uniqueness of the one God appears to have been adapted and widened to accommodate Jesus that is uniquely linked with the one God, which makes it the devotional pattern in which Jesus is central in which baptism involved the invocation of Jesus' name and corporate worship gatherings include the acts of invoking Jesus as Lord and a veneration of Jesus in the context of gathered worship with chantive hymns and odes. Now with that, we will move on to the second key characteristic of Christianity, which is its ethnic inclusivity. Roman era, as was typical throughout antiquity, religious identity was conferred at birth and was not, as Lariatado writes, a distinguishable category. In other words, ethnic identity was given at birth and the gods linked to that ethnic identity were part of the package. That is, whether you were Roman, Greek, Egyptian, Syrian or Gaul, or from any other people of the Roman world, you were expected to show piety towards the divinities tied to your ethnic identity. The expansion of the Roman imperial power brought with it the spread of the cults and deities of Rome so that they could be included among the deities reverenced by people other than the Romans. But this was a result of the Roman political and cultural influence and the reverence of the Roman deities was therefore seen as a natural way for the ancients to respond positively to that influence. One especially novel expression of this is the cult of the goddess Roma as a new deity in the various Eastern sites dating to the early second century BC, which shows a desire at least for these provinces to be identified with Roman power. There was also a development of the cult of the emperors or the imperial cult, beginning with the Roman ruler Julius Caesar, who is deified after his death and declared divine by the Roman Senate. Religious identity is therefore simply an extension of a person's ethnos, their national or ethnic identity, and is not a separate category, as Larry Hurtado writes. Your own gods were supplied as part of your birthright. They were household divinities that you acknowledged simply by being members of a given household, whether family member or slave, in addition, there were deities of your city, your people, and your nation, and so your religious duties of reverence were shaped very much by who you were, where or to whom you were born, and where you lived. In this sense, the Jewish people were no different as they were likewise defined as a nation, a distinct ethnic group. But in place of a pantheon of deities, they, there was only one and they typically did not sacrifice to the gods of the various lands where they were born or may have lived. 
This was a peculiar religious behavior, but it was tolerated in so far it was a distinctive feature of the Jewish ethnos. Therefore, what made the early Christian movement distinctive was a religious identity defined by their standing in relation to the one God, the biblical tradition, which was not dependent on or even connected to their ethnicity. Lariotardo finds a partial analogy for this sort of voluntary religiousness in the so-called mystery cults, as these cults exhibited an expression of religiousness distinguishable from or at least additional to the more traditional forms of religion that were conferred by birth. Two very popular mystery cults are the cult of Mithras and Isis. Mithras, for example, was originally a Persian deity, but a cult emerged in the West, which became very popular, especially for non-commissioned ranks of the Roman army. Another example is that of Isis, a deity of modest significance from Egypt, which again gained international reverence throughout the Roman world. But what these cults show at least is that religious identity and practice could involve more than the deities of one's family, city or nation. But the difference with the early Christian movement is that these cults did not demand exclusive devotion and their participation is done alongside other religious practices and associations connected to ethnic identity and is not a replacement for them. As Larry Hattada writes, the mystery cults are partially analogous to the sort of voluntary religiousness involved in becoming a participant in Christian circles, but the analogy breaks down precisely in the demand placed upon all Christians that they must make their Christian commitment the exclusive basis of their religious identity. Therefore, what made the early Christian movement distinctive was an exclusive religious identity which was also not dependent on ethnicity and in that sense it is ethnically inclusive. In this regard, the story of Cornelius in Acts 10 is important. What Peter learns in Acts 10 and what the early Christian movement affirmed is that Gentiles are set apart as holy and become full members of the Ecclesia, the Assembly of God, through baptism and faith in Jesus Christ, whilst also retaining their various ethnic identities. Paul in Galatians 3.28 famously declared that by their baptism into Christ, their ethnic, social and gender distinctions are relativized as all believers are now one in Christ Jesus. It is not in the sense that their distinctions are faced or no longer matter, they certainly do matter, but these distinctions did not define who was in or out of the kingdom of God. In other words, these distinctions no longer are to function as a way of justifying discrimination in the treatment of one another, for they were now one in Christ, no matter their ethnic, social and gender differences. Okay, thank you for watching. If you are enjoying this content, please do like, comment and subscribe. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments, so do, do let me know. And I look forward to seeing you next time as we'll examine two other distinctives of Christianity, its bookish and ethical character. Okay, I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for watching. Bye.